I focus everything on the west, so that would be Sherman's march to the sea and his siege of Atlanta. So pretty cool stuff. That's where my family basically took part in, and so that's what I try to portray as much as possible. But there are two different groups who do reenactment. There are mainstream reenactors, so what they do is they get uniforms that look close to the originals, and then there's authentic reenactors, which is what I'm a part of. And what we do is everything we have has to be as close, if not perfectly identical to an original article of uniform. So everything I have, all the way down to the stitching, the stitching here, through here, through here, all of that's critical and very important in what I do. Because when I'm teaching you about this, you're looking at as something that is close to an original uniform as you're gonna to get today. So that's pretty neat. What I'm wearing is all wool, no cotton. Cotton is great, it's comfortable, but what it does is it traps water. Water can cause problems with your health as you march throughout the Civil War. Think about this, four years of fighting in the Civil War, you don't get to sleep in a bed, you sleep on the ground. All you have is a ground cloth, which I have in here. All right, and on top of that ground cloth, I have a blanket, a big blanket. Mine stinks, but it's a big blanket. And that's what you have to sleep on. No pillow, nothing. If you want to have a pillow, you gotta put your head on something that you have already. But that's not what they had. They had a half of a shelter. Do you remember seeing those A-frame tents that you see, right? Well, a soldier was only responsible for half of that. Another soldier was responsible for the other half. You can button the two halves together, that creates your A-frame tent. So you had to have a buddy when you were marching. Now think about this. If you're marching every day, right, you are marching literally mile after mile up and down hills. Are we all gonna be in step at the same time? So if we start left, are we all gonna be in step? No. During the march, did it matter? No. During a parade, did it matter? Yes, absolutely. So that's critical to know when you're talking about an American Civil War soldier, whether it be Union or Confederate. They spent the days outside. They had a tent. Sometimes, most of the time, they slept under the stars. Because when you're carrying this much weight, think about this. I've got a haversack full of typically rations that are in little poke sacks, and I'll show you what all these things are. Plus my utensils, plus my toothbrush. If I had a toothbrush, Sometimes brushing your teeth wasn't necessarily as important as surviving the day, right? And any additional salt pork, rice, coffee would all be in this bag. And that's what would be my rations for the day. I get new rations each day if my regiment had it. So that's the key. If they had it, we were good. If they didn't, you went without. That's all there was to it. You didn't get to go out and forage for food because you needed to stay at your post. Stay with your, 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 uh, your, your, your group. So what I want to share, share with you guys is with a Civil War soldier, they have a hat, all right? This is a type two federal hat, okay? Forage hat is what it's called. This hat here is a 35th Indiana green kepi, which was noted as the first Irish and they were based out of southeastern Indiana. That's pretty neat. So, and we've got guys that reenact with this group all the way over to Evansville. So that's pretty neat. But this is how they could distinguish themselves apart, okay? And then we have what is called a Hardy hat. Hardy was a general in the American Civil War. A lot of times you'll see it curved up with nice fancy gold eagle right here. And you know, you've got actually the, the eagles over here nice band around it, but for most of the Civil War soldiers during the time, this is what they wore. They had a wide brim, they kept the sun off their face, kept them cooler, very important. Kept it off their necks, and of course when you're wearing this much wool, it gets hot fast. So, let's take a look at what I'm wearing. Sorry guys. All right, I got a canteen. This canteen is tin, and it's lined with beeswax inside, okay? And it's 
So that just allows it to be sealed. So when you're drinking your water out of this, which is great, sometimes you get a little chunk of beeswax depending on how old and how much use your canteen has had. This was one of the absolute must-haves, critical items that a Civil War soldier had to have on his persons at all times because water was hard to come by. Clean water specifically, right? So you've got that. Let me put this back on. Okay. And then I've got my haversack. What you see on the outside of my haversack is a large tin cup. That is their bowl for many of them. That is their glass for many of them. They would make coffee in this. They would boil things in this. So this is extremely important to have. Whether it was a large one or a small one, the cup was kind of their all-in-one you know, serving dish or baking dish. So that was critical for them to have. Now, when you take your cup off, terrible audio button. <laughs> okay, let me try that again. Okay, so then I open up my haversack. In cold weather, we would have some things like gloves. These are five finger gloves, but they're all wool. Okay, so it's important to know. I would also have a knit cap. Sometimes they would have night caps for when they would go to bed. Just depends on what they were used to at the time. And I'd also have a scarf, okay? All wool. You remember I was talking about those poke sacks? This is a poke sack. All right, it's just a cotton, cotton bag that you would put your rations in. The rations were helpful so that you could share them with your, 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 your fellow infantrymen or cavalrymen or artillerymen. You would share all that and try to make a very big dinner for all of you in a big pot. Okay, so that's what you would see there. Now, don't take this as something that was in the Civil War, but this is something that would have been important. This is a cleaning rod to clean those guns, all right? And it's just important for modern day reenactors to have a cleaning rod so that you can keep your gun clean. You don't want any mishaps when you're dealing with black powder. Black powder goes boom, and if you have a mishap, it's a big bad deal. <laughs> all right. So now, let's see, what else do I have in here? All right, well, just other cleaning stuff. So just know that that would usually have rations in it. Poke sacks. You'd have a plate. Now, I'm gonna be honest, this is not a proper plate. It's a little later in war, or later after the war, but it's a tin plate, and this would be something that some people may have or may not. If you have your tin cup, and it's a large tin cup, this plate. It's just too bulky, too much stuff to carry. When you're talking about carrying a bag like that versus a bag like this with fewer things, it's much nicer to take less than more. Okay, still made out of tin. Now, silverware. I have a knife. I have a three-prong fork. They also had two-prong forks. So, and then a big spoon. You guys probably have one of these in your, in your cupboards at home. They had them too. But I have a big spoon because that was meaning I could use it for stirring and I could take bigger bites. So that was important to have. Okay. All right, what else do I have? It's like Christmas, isn't it? Most soldiers had a knife. This is a replica of a Barlow, which is the name brand of the knife that was used during the American Civil War. They found them, they have them, all right? Not that we bring weapons to school, we don't. But it's important, this would be in their pocket, okay? So that's a Barlow knife. Now, this is something I think is important, and I have two Barlow knives, okay? Sometimes those types of those things are just important to have. This is your haversack. Now, this is something you'd be lucky to have, but it's critical that someone in your group have it. This is called a match safe. And what it does is it holds your matches. Now, what I want you to realize, and this is pretty neat, I'm not gonna strike one in here, but you've got your match, which is just a wooden stick with the, with the match part on the end. You can buy these today in boxes, which is exactly what this is from, but it's the exact same type of match they had in 1860. All 
right, so that's important. Why I have a match safe? One, on the bottom is where you can strike it. So you always have fire. Getting a fire at camp was absolutely important. That's the only way you could cook things. That's the only way you could make coffee. Okay, and coffee was a big deal during the American Civil War. It was a requirement for the guys. They needed it. It just made them happy. And being happy when you're marching is helpful. Because when you're marching 365 days a year for four years, you get exhausted. I can tell you, I marched one weekend and I was exhausted. It took me about two weeks to recover. Because it's a lot of, lot of marching. Just understand though, a Civil War soldier was about 20 years old. And in 1860, they were a bit more hardy than we are today. Make sense? So, a bit stronger, they can take a bit more than we can. We've got things a little bit easier today. Just, just think about how strong these young men were at the time. All right, so match safe. All right. Now, what am I wearing? I have on a shell, well, it's not a shell jacket. Um, this is, I gotta remember, sometimes I forget what I'm wearing, you know? So a shell jacket, just so you know, comes just to the top of the trousers. These are the top of my trousers. So a shell jacket would look just like this, a little bit more fitted, right? This is otherwise known as a sack coat or blouse, okay? And this is what most of the Union soldiers had, all right? It was cheap, it was easy, it fit most people. That was important, okay? Now, what are we looking at? My belt. I've got a belt, I've got a bayonet with a bayonet scabbard, and I've got my cap box. My cap box holds my caps for my musket. If I can dig it out. You gotta be quicker this in, than this in war. All right, that's what they hold. That's what provides the spark that lights the black powder to propel your projectile from the gun, okay? So very important that you have this. And you were only issued so many during a given day, okay? So you had to have them. Then this is my cartridge box. And what I have are some cartridges in here. You pull a cartridge out, you tear it, you pour the power down the, the, the barrel of the gun. Let's use my 1861 Springfield here. Okay, you tear it, you pour the powder down here. You take the ball that's in here too. I don't have a ball in here. But then you stick that in there. You pull your ramrod out. You shove it down, right? You hit it, and then you bring it back. Now, when you're doing all of that, your gun is like this, barrel out. You don't want to accidentally shoot yourself, right? No mishaps, that's a big deal. So it's always out when you're doing that. But that's what these are for. These are your, these are your bullets, your modern day bullets. Now, what did I have in here? I have two packs worth of cartridges, plus, let's see if I can take them out, or at least, and then I've got two more underneath. So I'm carrying four, so that's 40 rounds that I have in this pouch. Not right now, I've shot some, right? But that's what I'm typically carrying on me. I could have extra rounds, if I'm lucky, in my haversack, just so I have easy access to them. So just remember that. So that's how you use everything here, okay? Your, your uh, bayonet, when they say fix bayonets, again, your barrel is out, and you're gonna fix the bayonet. Prime example, we'll get the 1861 again. All right, fix bayonets here, here, And then you turn this. So this is your sight, your front sight. That's what locks into place. So my bayonet is not coming off, right? So now I'm ready to attack and I can stab. 
Now, one thing I want to let you know is you think, well, who gets stabbed by a bayonet? Well, my great-great-grandfather got stabbed twice. One at the Battle of Osaka, the other at the Battle of Bentonville. He survived. It's amazing that you could take something like this, pass it around, and think about that going through your body. It's pretty impressive, isn't it? Now, here's another thing I want you to think about. When the guys were marching, marching, they're tired, they're exhausted, they're hungry. They're thirsty, they're malnutrition, everything. They've got disease going on. But did we ever get to a point where we had hand-to-hand? -hand? We absolutely did. It wasn't just standing in two lines and then you shoot and then hope that you hit somebody. They literally got to a point where they had to fight hand-to-hand. -hand. People were killed because somebody got stabbed either via a knife, because a, a lot of Confederates had a big Bowie knife, right? But it's easier to stab you when you're this far away, right? That's a little bit of a thing. But this is also a club. You can use it to hit somebody. You can hurt somebody. There's a lot going on here, right? So now, if you all stand up, I'll let you hold the gun just to let you understand what kind of weight we're talking about here, okay? Don't worry, it's not loaded. It won't go off, okay? <laughs> Here, let me do something real quick. Let me do this. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, just hold it up like this. Now, that's the weight that a gentleman had to carry every single day of his entire military career, 1861 to 1865. Now, one thing I wanted to point out to you guys is do you think that's just one type of gun that was in the Civil War? Surprisingly, this is a flintlock musket. When did we use a flintlock musket? The American Revolutionary War. They were still around in the American Civil War. A lot, a lot of Confederates were using this. Pretty crazy. Now, Father, can I just go ahead and cock it or shoot it? There's nothing in the barrel, but, okay. So I wanna show you what, so you've got a flintlock musket, you got powder here, you load it the same way that you did the other, you pull the, the prison down, and when you shoot, watch the sparks. <laughs> gotta have it all the way back, it won't do it. Kind of cool, huh? So that is a flintlock musket. Now think about this. I'm putting that cat box on the Springfield, or maybe it's an infield rifle, right? So this, I have to take powder out, pour it, close it, load it, bring it back up, and then shoot it. Think how much longer this would take to load and fire, right? Much bigger bullet though, 75 caliber. That's a big bullet. No. Are you going to rifle it? No. And so they would not travel nearly as far. So while he's talking about rifling, we're talking about, and I'm talking to you guys about the weight that you have to carry. These are 10 rounds of actually, of, of ammunition with the bullet, okay? So pass that around and understand if I've got four of those in my bag, just how much extra weight I'm carrying every single day. Sometimes they didn't just expire, I mean like in July, they don't. The heat? No, I'm just oh. You. oh. The soldier, the weight and the heat. Amazing. It's amazing. But here's a catch. She she made up a good point. Why why didn't they just, you know, just just sweat completely to death? Well what they what they would do is they would drop a lot of stuff. 
The less stuff they had to carry, the better. But you still had to be in uniform. You were still part of the United States military. So you had to be in uniform. So uniform parts were not something that you could march without. But, now this is something I think you guys are gonna find interesting. Okay, so I've been talking to you a little bit about weight, right? Now, think about this on your back, okay? Are you ready? All right. Think. Okay. Now, think about that on your back. Don't try not to punch her in the face. And think about having a gun that weighs the amount that it does, the ammo weighing the amount that it does, the extra gear that you need in order to survive, and eat, and sleep as it does. Think about what a 100-pound frame, 20-year-old male is having to carry every single day for 365 days a year for four solid years. Amazing. It's amazing. Okay? So it's got a lot of weight, okay? So now I wanna show you what's in here. Thank you, sir. This is something you may or may not want. You won't want it def definitely during the winter, so they'll get rid of it, uh, or you won't want it for the summer, so they'll get rid of it for any summer months. But this is called a great coat. It's your jacket. And I'm gonna tell you, on a cold night, it's your blanket, on top of your blanket. So that's what this is, okay? Then, this goes on your back, obviously, as you know, so it's a backpack, right? And these are straps for either the blanket or the great coat or anything else you wanna put out here. So now, I'm gonna open up this, and I've got it stuffed. So these are some items that a soldier would carry in general. Remember that ground cloth I was telling you about? This protects you from the moisture of the ground, okay? This is, this is a painted blanket. So it's like a tar-like thing on the blanket, okay? And you can see the mud that's on it. That's because when I was using it, that's exactly what we were protecting ourselves against, the mud. Some would have a hatchet, a hand hatchet. Great to have, awfully heavy to carry. So most would not, you know? So think about that. All right, we're gonna get in here. This has two pockets. We're gonna open this up. Some requirements. Everybody should have an extra pair of socks. They're wool socks. They really keep your feet as healthy as possible during any marching, whether it be hot or cold. This, is new and I haven't got to use it yet, but this is an undershirt. So if you put on a white t-shirt and then put a shirt over it, this is that white t-shirt that you're wearing. Okay? It's long, but it's comfortable. So think about that. This is an issued shirt. Okay? Canton flannel. So it's comfortable, but they only came in so many sizes. Pants only came in three sizes. Jackets only came in two or three sizes. Unless you had something that was called private issue, you would not be able to get something that fits you. Now, as an older, <laughs> as an older person today doing reenactment, they wouldn't make things as big as I wear back in 1861, because those boys and girls were not that big. Right? Today, all of us reenactors are that big, so, because we're the only ones that can afford to do this at this point, so it's kind of silly. All right, so here we go. This is the important part of this bag. You remember I was talking to you about a shelter half? Well, here's your shelter half. This is that tent that we were talking about. You see how it has some buttons on one side and button holes on the other? That is what you would put together to make your shelter. So, kind of neat. Not warm, but kind of neat. And then finally, the only thing to keep you warm during the elements. So think about this. 
This is your blanket. And this is a U.S. issued blanket. It's reproduction, of course. But look how big this thing is. And you've got to carry it with you everywhere. So this, on top of this, is how your Civil War soldier would sleep. Okay? They may have another one of these to go on top of that if they're sleeping out under the stars to keep any moisture off of them. But that's exactly what they would use. So, when you guys look at all this, this is what your Civil War soldier had to carry. You've got some extra bullets. You got a tin cup. Right. And of course you've got your hat. Right? And you've got your gun. Now, here's another cool thing I was just gonna bring to you because I think it's just fun to have. Right? This is an 1861 U.S. cavalry saber. Okay? That is a long saber. But think about this. The only people who use this are those who are on top of the horse. Right? So look how much distance I have, even if I lean over from my horse. That's your cavalry. All right? They have a cavalry belt, so this just hangs off of their torso. So go ahead and check that out. Don't pull it out, but just. Is it actually sharp? That's sharp. And it's pointy. <laughs> okay? And the final thing I'm going to show you is musicians. 50-50 shot this, exist, this existed or it didn't. Today, it exists, we use it. Fife, okay? I'm not gonna play a tune, but I'm gonna just play so you can hear how loud it is. Hear how loud that is? That's one of the two instruments that would get back to the back group of your marching regiment. All right, so that's important to know. We had music that could, you know, be heard. The other, do you, does anybody know what the other instrument would be? Trumpet? No. They did have bugles. Bugles were important, but not as often as the fife. The drums, right? So that was the drums. So. Okay, we should good there. All right, so what did the Civil War soldier have to work with? They had deportment that they had to deal with. Shoulder arms, this is something that they would carry every day. This is how they would carry it. But if you're marching and you're getting tired, you can put it up here. All right, we had two manuals that we had to work with. Hardy, who's named after the Hardy, or who the Hardy hat is named after, or Casey's manual. Okay, so that's what the U.S. Casey was the later version before Hardy, but that's what the U.S. Army used, Casey's manual. So then you go back to shoulder arms. You could do a rest, right? So that's a rest. But let me show you how we did it and how people would do it during a long march. So, some would just do this, right? Some would just do this. Right. Now, what if I wanted to keep the uh, rain off of my off of my gun? You're going to come down through here like this. It keeps everything off of the barrel of the gun, and it keeps my locking mechanism clean and dry. So that's important, right? Bring it back up, back to shoulder arms. So there's some there's a, a whole list of various things that they would have to use, but this is what they would use during their marching. Parades are different. Sometimes when they're, when they're marching, they would do presentation. So whoever's over here that's of importance, they would have their gun to show proudly their gun. All right? And then they would present to the individual, and then they would, you know, look forward again, and then probably go back to shoulder arms. Okay? So, the gun. It's important to know that this was just more and I talked about it already a little bit, but it's just more than your firing weapon. This is your life and death opportunity. This is the only thing keeping you alive. Sometimes this is your walking stick. Sometimes this is your battering ram. Sometimes 
you can't fire fast enough. You need to fire three volleys within a minute to be able to be up to standard for the United States Army during the American Civil War. I pop this open. I grab a cartridge. Right? Don't do that, you're dead. So I put my bullet in. Now it's not a bullet, it's a biodegradable wand. I push it down. Tap it. And then I'm ready. Okay? When they say prime, I get in here, I grab my cap, I put my cap on. I go to full cock, and when they say fire, right? Not bad, right? Infantry regiment of the war had 300 guys. Imagine 300 guys firing at the exact same time. Which we saw all that smoke. And keep in mind, you still have artillery behind you, so the cannons are still firing. So that's additional smoke, which is going beyond you. And here's the thing I want you to realize. While I'm standing here shooting, I may have a guy down here shooting. So our guns are right next to one another. And the one thing I don't want to do is shoot my guy, right? So that's important. And that would be cadenced according to however the officers want that to, to happen. So that's all important to know how these guys would fight with these weapons going forward. Now, I what I want you to understand is this was about half the volume of a real round with four, with, with pure black powder, okay, which is more in line of what the, the actual Civil War soldiers used. So double that volume is what you're dealing with plus there's a projectile that's extremely accurate for being a big long gun like this a big black powder gun like this sir the football field is 100 yards long we're standing at that the civil war soldier could easily hit a target at that range at the other side of that field but keep in mind that takes practice yeah because if i don't know how much into guns you guys are or not but Think about holding this weapon. You remember how heavy it was. Think about holding it steady. If I need additional length or, or depth, I've got a sight. Now I want to show you something. I'm just going to aim at the white uh, pole there. With it down, I'm looking at the end of my gun and there's where it's, it, I'm aiming at. If I pull this up, now look what happens. Right, it goes down. So if I'm shooting high, I put this up, and it'll drop. I've got two different two different options. Here's my other option. So it's not as high, but I still have three different sights on this gun. So think about AT60 and the advancement of firearm technology or technology in general to be able to produce these on such a scale, you know, hundreds and hundreds, millions of these guns, right? And think about all the unique benefits to this. This is a percussion cap gun. It was a big advancement over the flintlock gun, but yet flintlocks were still used during the American Civil War. You know, this is a, a 54 caliber. There's a 68 caliber uh, infield rifle, which a lot of the Confederates used, which they got from England. So that's important to know. But it all comes down to who has the weapons, because you don't have, not all the Confederates, or mostly uh, the Confederates, didn't get all the guns because they weren't coming in from England as quickly. So you've got a lot of things, a lot of people are helping. We've got France involved, we've got England involved. There's a lot going on here to make this war happen. And there's a lot of interest at play as to who wins. So that's, that's important for your studies just to know that. Um, and why were we involved in this anyway? Was it slavery? Was it secession? 
hey, it's 2022, and I'm going to tell you there's still a big argument about who's, which one it is. So that's what you got to figure out. That's what you got to learn. That's what you got to study. Get to those battlefields. The battlefields are cool because when you can imagine where the soldiers were at and what they were fighting for and where they were from, it's impressive. Now, real quick question. How did soldiers get from one area to another real quickly? Did they march it? No, by train. They took trains to get where they needed to be and then they would start their marches. So that's that's something that you need to know. There trains were. I'm oh, sorry. There were train routes in the south. Well, Sherman went to go destroy the train routes in the south. That's why he wanted to stop that. So the Confederates couldn't move, but the Union could. So, all right. Ready? March. <laughs> Yep, you want to touch the guy's shoulder next to you. 